Welcome back to a new week on Out of the Bubble podcast. I hope everybody is keeping well and that you are really looking after your own mental well-being during this really turbulent, horrific time that's happening in Ukraine. It's, it's heartbreaking and there's a real sense of helplessness watching all the evil that's happening. But I hope that you are gaining strength from seeing the, the good things because there's some amazing people out there that are doing really inspiring work to support the Ukrainians and to support people that are really struggling and I think it's important to try and remember that there, there's so much good in the world and so many great people out there that are really doing fantastic work. And I'm trying to focus on that as much as I can and really kind of trying to, I think that's the only way forward really to try and focus on all the amazing good things that are happening and hope that it comes to an end soon. So my thoughts are with everybody. This week's guest is Dr. Mary McLeod. Dr. Mary is an evolutionary biologist. She's a speaker and she's a science writer, and she's an expert on human behavior. And she's now using all her vast experience as a behavior scientist to help women in midlife approach dating with a more scientific approach. And I think it's a really interesting conversation. We've had lots of conversations recently on the podcast with women that are dating at the moment, that are single in midlife, and it is a minefield. And perhaps by listening to Dr. Murray's great advice about how you can change your mindset and approach things in a more scientific way really might help you make that shift to putting your boundaries in place and protecting yourself creating more self-love for yourself and starting from a place of more confidence so it's a really interesting conversation grab a coffee and enjoy so good morning Mary how are you this morning hi there Rachel I'm very well thank you it's it's good to see you it is, and you know we've um, we've been we've been chatting a lot, and I'm really looking forward to this conversation, particularly because in the run up to this, I've I've discussed quite a lot about relationships and divorce and life again as a single woman in the 40s. So this is really timely. So I'm really looking forward to this conversation. I've already introduced you, but how do you introduce yourself to people? Um, I would say I'm a biologist first and foremost. Um, I kind of look at the world through the sort of lens of um, how we've evolved to be um, and certainly in the last few years I've been focusing on sort of applying a biological approach to helping women mainly um, sort of looking at the the differences in the ways men and women approach things from a, you know and that that's kind of rooted in our biology um, but also society plays a massive role in that as well obviously um, and yeah, I, I would introduce myself as a, a dating consultant using a biological approach because I'm helping women, particularly women in midlife, um, to, to find a, a new partner. Oh, fabulous. And, and before we get to the kind of nitty gritty of the science part, which I think is fascinating, how did this, how did it evolve for you? Where, what's your background so people can get an idea of where you've come from? Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, well, I, as I say, I'm a biologist. I started out actually studying animal behaviour. So I spent um, my 20s and some of my 30s sort of exploring the world, trogging around jungles um, um, on, on the sea, um, studying whales. But I was mostly studying monkeys. Um, so I studied monkeys in Brazil and uh India, South Africa. Wow. Um, but then when I started having babies, I came back to the UK and, and I was I started having babies. I couldn't really carry on with that kind of stuff, obviously. Um, so then I took to being a, a freelance science journalist writing about behaviour. Um, and more and more that became about human behaviour and a lot of um, attraction and relationships. And also, you know, as I said, how men and women do things differently. Um, and certainly in the last few years, I've realised that I can apply that knowledge to, to helping people in, in the real world um, to, to sort of find different ways of doing things that actually goes with rather than against our evolved motivations and aspirations. And, so, and as I say, I'm using that to, to help women find a good partner, because I think sometimes we make mistakes, don't we? With we do. But I'm lot. very guilty of that myself in the yeah, past. Yeah, we, we all are. Hands up there. That, you know, lots of women yeah. I spoke to recently about their recent kind of dating experiences will confer with that, I'm sure. Yeah. So, you know, why midlife women in particular? Um, well, it's, it's where my experience lies at the moment. I'm 55. Um, but I think... Um, women in midlife have a different set of challenges and also advantages when it comes to dating. Um, you know, we're past the, the stage of trying to find a guy to have babies with. Um, and so 
that actually releases us from a lot of constraints because we're, we know we don't have a, a biological clock ticking. We don't need to find a guy, you know, or, or pick a guy on, on a genetic basis for, for being a, a good genetic father for children. Um, we, we're, you know, more likely to be independent, financially independent, be able to kind of pick and choose and leave something if we don't like it. Um, so we do have a lot of advantages. Um, and also hormonally, we're, we're different. We're, you know, we're either peri or post or mid menopause. Um, and that actually changes kind of our outlook and, you know, what we're looking for as well. Um, and in, in some good ways, actually, <laughs> it's quite surprising. Um, but I think there's there's a lot to be said for, for reaching this stage of life. It's I, th I think it's a really positive thing. I mean, obviously, there are drawbacks if you're having difficult symptoms, but in terms of what this stage of life has evolved for, it's, it's really positive because it's, it's all about, um, you know, taking care of, of your social networks, changing what you're doing, um, embracing new opportunities and imparting your, your built up wisdom. So I think it's a great cohort of, of women to be working with. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's, you know, especially with the increase of, of divorce rates going up for, for women over 40 and 50, I think it's now more than ever, we, we need this, this kind of support and, and new ways to work. And it's yeah. always been very much led by the heart, whereas you're coming at it from a really scientific background, which I find is really interesting. So how does that, how does that work? Um, well, I mean, as, as, as I've kind of alluded to um it's about understanding where we're coming from biologically um and so a lot of us make mistakes when we're, we're choosing guys we go for the bad boys we um <laughs> you know i certainly have in the past um you know we we might pick guys who end up um you know they turn out to be players or narcissists or whatever and we end up in a very unhappy situation and that's you know, definitely been my experience um, as well. But um, I think the problem is we tend to follow our gut instincts when we sort of get together with someone. You know, we, we go with the chemistry, we go with who we fancy right away. Um, but the problem is those gut instincts evolved back in the Stone Age, you know, and, and we needed different things back then. You know, the, the important stuff for a woman to look out for were, was a, a big, strong, tough guy that could fight off other guys and, and get resources for her and her children and, and protect her. Um, not so much nowadays and not so much at this time of life. <laughs> yeah. So, so, you know, my contention is that we need to kind of consciously evolve our, our preferences so that they suit us in the modern world and for the life stage we're at. And so that's what my programme Dating Evolved is all about. It's, it's about getting to that stage and, and understanding what it is we really need and how we can, you know, come to find that and desire that. And you, you know, you've been, you've, you've already mentioned the fact that you, you've been through the, the, the kind of dating scenario where you've, you've met the wrong people. So how did you find your husband? How did you find the right person? What kind of process did you go through? Um, well, I realised that I, you know, I've been on my own for a long time as a single mum mm -hmm. and um, getting pretty lonely. And I realised I had to completely change my ways because I was, you know, even once I was at that stage, I, I tried online dating and stuff, still picking the wrong kind of guys and, you know, guys that, that didn't want to commit or, you know, were emotionally unavailable or whatever. Um, so I realised I had to completely change things. And then, I, you know, after having spent a good number of years writing about human behaviour and, and in particular attraction and relationships, I realised, actually, I've got this information in, in, mm -hmm. you know, at my fingertips. So I kind of pulled it all together to kind of, you know, put together a strategy um and you know very soon after that I met my my husband and he's somebody that you know he's I absolutely adore him he's the love of my life but I wouldn't have even noticed him in the old days if I'd been following my old ways of looking for guys um you know he it wasn't sort of lust at first sight it was you know the chemistry what you know the fireworks weren't firing off but you know I knew he was a, a nice guy he was a good guy and we you know we got to know each other over time well, that, glad that happened <laughs> yeah I mean there are lots of women saying well that's exactly what I want but I don't know how to get there so can you share some kind of tips of, of where to even start because because it can be kind of you, you you know we do historically look in the wrong place don't we yeah I, th I think the very first thing to get sorted is getting your self-esteem and confidence sorted 
because you know if you have good self-esteem and if you have high confidence those are, are the most powerful tools you'll have for finding the right guy for you because you know you if, if you have good self-esteem it means you're not going to put up with crap basically because you're not thinking oh there won't be anyone else for me you know yeah. I'm not with it, or, or you know that kind of thing um, and if you have a high level of confidence well we know how attractive confident people come across it can transform you it makes you glow so you know that's that's a really powerful tool as well so in terms of how to increase um these qualities um the science shows us that you know it, it, you, we have to understand that every kind of type of person every body type every personality is attractive to some people we might not think that when we see you know the stuff out there in the media that tends to sort of stereotype attractiveness and you have to be this this yeah. and this otherwise you're you know you're not not worth it um but the science shows that you know in terms of what men find attractive it it depends on a whole host of different things their personality their age their their weight um their um whether they've eaten um lately you know all sorts of weird and wonderful things but also their their attitudes um you know whether they they are you know what their attitudes to gender roles are for instance and things like that so you know guys who are more sexist for instance they're more likely to put a high premium on very very feminine characteristics whereas guys who are a bit more egalitarian will will have different attitudes so basically there's someone out there for everybody um, yeah. is the message. and so that's one of the things I, I get across but I think it's also important to think about your good your own good qualities your your own unique qualities and it's it's the unique qualities that are actually the the most attractive things that the most important um traits in you that are going to attract the right kind of person and will make them you know be really into you <laughs> you know yeah. you might put some people off but that doesn't matter because they're not the right people for you um and i think it's worth you know if, if you feel that you need your confidence and self-esteem bumping up a bit I think it's really worth talking to your friends and people that know you, you know, what are my good qualities? What do you think that I bring to the world? Because we often forget, don't we? Yeah, <laughs> we, really we do. Yeah, that. especially when you are low yourself, when you have a low self-esteem, yeah. it's very hard to trust your own kind of beliefs, isn't it? Absolutely. And so, you know, make a list of them. You know, maybe you're a good listener. Maybe your your friends know they can trust you if they've got a problem. You know, maybe you're a great cook and you love having people around for dinner. Maybe, you know, you could there will be things that you bring to the world that are good good things and um one of the things i think is a good habit to have is to write down three things at the end of each day that you like yourself for or or if, if you don't if you're not used to liking yourself maybe you could say what you would like someone else for you know that, that you've done and it could be tiny things just like you know smiling at someone in the street and they smile back and that made you feel good you know yeah. but or it could be bigger things you know but if you get in a habit of noticing the good things that you're doing it will you know alert you to the fact that yeah I am a good person yeah. I'm, I've got lots of good qualities and and you know you need to get into that mindset of thinking a guy would be really lucky to be with me <laughs> you know absolutely and I'm sure that's you know true of everyone yeah and uh, you know obviously you 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 coach women through this process how long do you normally how long do your coaching groups last because this is over a certain period of time isn't it I'm just interested in how long that takes to get to that point yeah well my main program um my group program uh we do a weekly session of um once a week over seven weeks and we right. get together in small groups so I, I sort of cap it on eight so that's a really nice little intimate group on, online yeah. Zoom. um and I've, I've been amazed at how brilliant women are at supporting each other you know I, yeah. I, I thought it would happen but it's just sort of surpassed um what I expected you know women are so supportive of each other and I think get so much encouragement and, and accountability and everything from having having a small group going through the same process yeah. I mean everyone's experience is slightly different but there, there are lots of commonalities and it's really nice seeing people support each other so we have the um the seven weeks of weekly sessions and then after that um we have monthly kind of catch-ups um and people can you know carry on with that as long as they like so it means that you know so some women kind of get out there dating right away you know even while we're in the, the sort of weekly sessions and some sort of want to kind of wait till the end of that before they'll start you know writing their dating profile and getting out there so you know obviously it takes different amounts of time for different people um but 
yeah, I mean, it, it's been absolutely amazing. We've had some incredible success stories and it's just been wonderful, you know, getting messages from from people, you know, oh, I'm doing this thing with my new guy and it's just so great. I mean, I had a message, I'm just thinking of um, one before Christmas um, that I got from a lady called Adele who did one of our first programmes and she's been with a new guy for a good while now and, you know, really happy. And uh, she said, "I'm putting, we're putting up the Christmas tree together and it's so nice to not be doing this alone. And oh, so <laughs> oh, nice. So nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, how much, how, that's just so rewarding, isn't it? It is really, really. And what about online dating? Because, you know, I interviewed um, a lady called Claire Kenny last week about her experiences in the 40s on online dating. And she said it was absolutely horrendous and hated it and would never do it again. So you know, what about me? Because that's another minefield in itself, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, a lot of us have had horrible experiences with online dating. But I think I think a lot of it comes down to the attitude, again, you know, that you approach it with. Um you know, if you come at it thinking, oh, it's going to be terrible, there's all these scammers and nasty people out there, it will make you kind of come across as negative and you might, you know, be tempted to write your profile in such a way as like, know this, know that, and must be such and such. And that just comes across as really unfriendly and not trusting. And you probably won't spot the good guys because you won't be expecting them. Um, I think it's important to kind of be willing to kind of read people's profiles. And there are some good guys out there. There really honestly are. I met, I met my husband on Match.com, so I'm, well, I'm an advocate. Yeah. <laughs> You're a perfect advert for it. I mean, yeah, I've got a friend who got married last year um, on Zoom, you know, um, because of the, the lockdown. But she met her husband on Tinder, of all places. Mm. And she's in her mid-50s, so, so is he. They're, they're, they're both high-powered professionals. You know, they... they um, he's he's fantastic and you know so don't make any assumptions about online dating or even the apps you know yeah. there's always a chance I mean what I say to to women I think um it's not necessarily the best way of meeting men because you know it does objectify us it objectifies them too obviously um and men often put a lot of limits on themselves and what they'll consider online I mean my husband said to me that um when he had done online dating in the past he would never have considered a woman who was older than him or one that had kids mm. i am both of those yes. yeah <laughs> when he met me in real life it was a different matter um but that said i think that you know it's a numbers game the more men that we can come into contact with the more we can assess for whether they have the right qualities for us um and so it's just another way of, of meeting guys. Yeah. But I think one of the important things about online dating is trying to be specific about what who you are and what you're looking for. Because if you kind of blandify yourself to be sort of generally attractive, um, you won't kind of, you know, you won't have any sort of filter for, for the kind of guys that you're really after. You want to get your unique qualities in and also mention, you know, specific things that you're into you know you could say in your profile you know I I love nature and wildlife and you know I'll be I'll be so happy if you want to come with me um you know trog trogging up a, a hill on a Sunday afternoon or, or whatever you know mention something a real thing that, that you'd yes. be interested in doing and then you can assess guys for how they respond to that you know so if you get just a general, hey, how are you? What are you doing tonight? Kind of thing. Um, then you know it's just a sort of cut and paste, um, yeah, you know, uh, scattergun approach that this guy's having, and he might not be interested in an actual relationship. But if a guy is prepared to invest in a sort of specific, proper individual conversation with you, that's a good first sign that he's actually for real and he, he wants something um, yeah. more. Yeah, that makes complete sense. Mark and I's first conversation one Saturday night was planning our trip, um, Route 66 in America, to the point oh. where we'd even planned out our playlist of, of songs that we would listen to. <laughs> we yet to do that, but we will do it. I was going to say, uh, <laughs> how, how, yeah, how long still, are you with that plan? Yeah, no, we've not done it yet, but, but hopefully now that COVID's kind of releasing us all out again, then hopefully we can plan that. But yeah, yeah. it was interesting that we did have that commonality of shared love of traveling and music and that that came through in the conversation very quickly which is really interesting that you've said that but if you're not happy to date online which lots of people don't aren't don't feel comfortable 
how do you find, where do you even look to meet somebody else? Because it's not like when we were younger, when we were going out clubbing or we were going out to nightclubs and drinking and it, our social life and our lives change as we get older. It's very hard, isn't it, to, to know where to look? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's, there's the kind of, I suppose, maybe ob obvious things like, you know, singles events, um, meetup groups for, for singles, or even meetup groups not for singles, but, you know, you're, you're going to come into contact with new people. Um, classes. Um, obviously, if, if you're going to go for classes, do something that you enjoy, you know, <laughs> yeah. because, you know, then you'll meet, meet people that other people that enjoy the same sorts of things as you. And you don't want to be seen as, you know, you, you want it to be fun, basically. Mm. Um, but it's also worth thinking about maybe the, the proportion of men that are going to be there. You know, if you go to a choir, and I would entirely recommend that. It's a great thing to do and it makes you feel good and make friends. But you'll probably find it's all women or mostly women. Um, whereas maybe another kind of music group, um, like a ukulele group, for instance, um, that, that would be a good one. Um, sports clubs, uh, woodworking classes, <laughs> you know. That's yeah. Typical. But you, you see what I mean? And, yeah. and it's not just because there's been more men there, but you get a different quality of interaction with men there if there are more men than women um you know where men feel that they have to sort of compete for the attention of women um then they will behave in a very different way and it's generally in our favor <laughs> so that's what the science shows um but you don't have to just you know try and meet men at, at places designed for meeting people um you can meet people anywhere obviously yeah. and you know i think that the the thing here is to get into a habit of speaking to people, all people, not just you know, potential partners or anything. Just get into the habit of making conversation wherever you are, you know, chat with the person next to you in the, the queue at Starbucks or whatever. Um, you know, in the supermarket, walking the dog, um, on the train, you know, anywhere. Um, and then, you know, when you do spot a guy that you quite like the look of or you seem, you know, seems quite interesting, then it's not such a big deal to actually make a conversation with them. But you can go slightly further, you can maybe ask a favour, you know, oh, could you watch my laptop while I go and get a coffee or, yeah. you know, and asking for that little bit of investment from somebody is a really nice way of starting a conversation, um, you know, or can you just reach that thing on the top shelf for me? Or, yeah. you know, it, it might sound a bit kind of little womanish, but not at all. I mean, you know, guys just like us, they like to feel needed and that they, you know, they're appreciated and things so there's nothing wrong with that it's just a nice way of starting a conversation yeah. so I would you know get into the habit of doing that so do um, you do you think that that women if they stop looking so hard and they just keep their, an open mind and, and are really kind of have got to a place where they're more confident in themselves and they get on with their life that when they stop looking is is are they more likely to find somebody than actually kind of directly going out looking for them I'm not sure, actually. Um, you know, I hear a lot of people saying, oh, you know, I'm just going to wait for the universe to mm. deliver. <laughs> you know? yeah. I'm, I'm, I don't really subscribe to that idea because, mm. well, for a couple of reasons. I mean, one is, you know, if you don't make an effort, um, then, you know, like, how's it going to happen? By magic. <laughs> you know, yeah. you need to come into contact with more and more guys to be able to find one that's a good guy. Um, and, and also, sometimes the good guys are the ones that won't necessarily approach you themselves. Um, so, so by kind of waiting and, and not being prepared to make any moves, you might actually be just exposing yourself to the duff guys. And that might give you the impression there are no decent men around. Yeah. And, and the reason I say that is because guys who have a high level of agreeableness, that's one of the personality factors. And, and that's what we want, because that means he's empathetic, he's more likely to be considerate and so on. Um, those kind of guys tend to be a little bit less confident, but they're also, because they're more considerate, they're more respectful. You know, they won't want to kind of barge around and, and um, you know, approach you in, in a way that they, you know, they might be worried that you want to be approached. Yeah. So I think it's really important to sort of try and make yourself approachable um, to the right guys. And that means, you know, things like don't be on your phone all the time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you yeah. say, say you're going to meet up with a friend at a cafe. What you could do is arrive a bit early so that you're on your own for a bit. And don't be sitting there on your phone. Just sit down and survey the scene, have a look around you. 
um, you know, make eye contact with people. And actually, if you if you are trying to make eye contact with a guy you're interested in, you know, you have to make a lot of eye contacts because otherwise they, they, they don't know. You know, just a little glance, they won't have a clue. That needs to be obvious. <laughs> you have to be quite obvious. <laughs> Open body posture, you know, um, smile, you know, look approachable. And, and obviously there's nothing stopping you from making a move yourself if, if you feel like it. And actually I can tell you um, my story of meeting my husband and, and it's a, a case in point. So we met at a, a singles night in a pub in Edinburgh. And um, so me and my friend, we, we went in and we went up to the bar, we got our free drink that was you know part of the singles evening and sort of turned around to look at the scene. And basically there were a lot of, guys in the, in the pub just kind of on their own at different tables it was like the staked out little territories around the pub <laughs> it was really strange and um it's like well how are we supposed to go and speak to anyone and um I spotted Rob who is now my husband and uh he was standing at one of the tables and I thought I'd, I'd quite like to speak to him um he looks he looks nice mm. but I don't really know how to do it and um then, then a, a, a group of women came into the pub and I happened to know one of them and they just happened to go and stand at opposite Rob on the same table and thought oh I'll go and speak to them yeah <laughs> <laughs> I happened to start speaking to them and then managed to sort of sidle around the table and started chatting to Rob and um, so that's how our conversation got going um, and so it was me that made the first move and it was funny because just recently I, I was speaking to him about this and I said you know, when we met at the singles night, if I hadn't approached you, would you have come up to me? And and I know that he was interested because he, he previously told me that, you know, when he saw me come in, he thought, oh, I quite like the look of her. Yeah. And, um, and he, he said, actually, I don't know if I would, because, oh. he, he's, <laughs> because he, he, he wasn't that confident about, you know, making an approach. Yeah. I thought, wow, you know, if I hadn't done that, if I hadn't gone to that trouble, we would never have met you yeah. know we would not have have got together and he's the love of my life that wouldn't have happened yes. so I think you really do have to make an effort I mean even going to that singles night you know I didn't even feel like it my friend asked me to go along with her and I thought oh it was January and it was cold and wet and I was busy and I thought oh it's going to be rubbish and <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but but I actually said to myself I said Mary this is your new way um, you have to make opportunities for yourself. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> I, I gave myself a talking to. And um, and so I went. But but that's what I would try and get across to other women. You have to make opportunities for yourself because you just yeah. never know. And the more people you meet, the more chance you have of meeting that right person for you. And when you, when and you then, it's, then it's a matter of sussing them out and seeing whether they have the right qualities or not. When, when you did actually meet him then, was it a slow burner or did you know after that first meeting that you were, because I think people still expect that light bulb moment where they just know and it's quite often not the case at all. Yeah, well, I think that is that is the big mistake a lot of women make. Um, so, no, I knew I was interested in him, but it wasn't like, oh, wow, you know, this is it, love at first sight or anything, not at all. Um, I was interested enough to know that I would like to kind of keep up contact. And as it happened... Um, it was quite funny because I was running some workshops on the signs of attraction. <laughs> and at this point in time, this was a few years ago, it was it was for sort of all ages and both, you know, both sexes. Um, and so I, um, I told him about it and I, I gave him my card. So it gave me an excuse to keep in contact. And um, so he actually signed up for the classes. <laughs> To be honest, I don't know if he actually wanted to come to the classes themselves or whether it's just because he was interested. <laughs> but, um, but we got to know each other over the course of a few weeks. And over that time, I sort of I kind of decided that I was interested in him. Um, but I wasn't sort of feeling that kind of, oh, I really fancy him thing. But then towards the end of the, the course that I was running, um, he, he asked me if I wanted to go along to a pub session. Um, he was I'm going to be playing ukulele and singing like it was a ukulele group that's why mm. I mentioned ukulele groups earlier um and I thought to myself well this this will be the make or break because I know that if a guy has good musical skills that really does it for me yeah <laughs> so off I went to the pub and uh, I think we got to about the end of the second song and it's like 
okay <laughs> yes yes this is for me and you know that that was I had decided I had to wait for him to kind of get around to you know making a move as well a bit, yeah. a bit more of a move but uh, he did in the end and um the rest is history <laughs> exactly yeah and I was it, it, it did sort of gradually build up and, yeah. and you know it it's sort of you know, when I compare it to my previous relationships, my previous relationships were all like, you know, oh yeah, I fancy this guy right away. And then things gradually fell apart. Yeah. But this has been kind of the opposite, you know, um, it's built up and just got better and better and better. And, you know, um, the, the sort of desire part builds up over time if you really like the person and, you know, you like yeah. their sense of humour. And, and also this, this confidence thing. I mean, we... Um, as women, we're very attracted to confidence in men. And that sometimes leads us to go for hyper-confident men. Who, who, and that's kind of dangerous because often they end up being narcissists or yeah. some other really bad thing. Um, but we need to see a bit of confidence. And for me, you know, for you know, meeting my man, it was his confidence when he was singing. You know, he he was owning the room. He he seemed to be in charge then. That was that was the thing. And that mm -hmm. that was really um attractive. So I think, you know, if you come across a good guy, say your friends, first of all, but, you know, you think it might be worth pursuing, try and find his confident sweet spot, I put it. Um, you know, maybe he's a good music musician, maybe he's a great, you know, teacher, maybe you can hear him give an authoritative lecture on something. And, and the important thing is seeing other people impressed with them as well. You know, we really like that when other people are impressed. So we think, oh. Other people like them. He must be good. <laughs> um, so I think that's something to really look out for, and that that can really sort of stir up um, the desire if it wasn't there before. Yeah, and you've you, you've touched on kind of a few times in this conversation about the kind of values, the face values of what we should be looking for. So what can you explain that a bit more? What are the values that we should be really looking for? Do you think? Yeah, well, I mean, one of the things that I talk with with my um, uh, the ladies who do my course about is thinking about your wants versus your needs you know so your want your wants I would say are things that are nice to have but are negotiable you know that you don't have to have them for a good relationship so you might be really attracted to tall guys I mean most of us women like tall men um, but is it really that important is it something that you can maybe compromise on a bit does he have to share your hobbies maybe not you can do th things with other people um, you know, does he have to have a, a stellar salary? You know, I mean, that's probably not the most important thing. And then think about your needs. What, what do you really need to have to, for a good relationship? And that will be things like um, your sort of deeply held values, you know, what's really important to you in life. And that needs to align with your partner. But the other thing that comes into this is what his personality characteristics are and what his attachment style is. Um, because that will have a big impact on whether or not you can have a good relationship with this person. So, you know, one example is we women tend to be attracted to kind of dominant high status guys. Um, and that that's understandable. That's this gut instinct thing that evolved back in the day because, you know, we need, needed guys to be able to get access to, to stuff for us things. But, you know, we older women in particular, we tend to be fairly self-sufficient. We don't need a guy to be helping yeah. us look after babies. We don't need a guy to um, earn money for us and things. And the, the personality characteristic that goes with, with um, being high status and competitive is actually the opposite to somebody that, that is high in agreeableness and therefore empathy, consideration, reliability, that kind of thing. So if you're going for these sort of bad boy traits if you like um you're probably not going to have a good long-term relationship so we need to kind of shift our thinking and you know look at what we really need in a partner um and that would be i would suggest that you know he is reliable he's considerate of your needs um there, there's a, a quality that psychologists talk about called the welfare trade-off ratio and what this is is like if you have a high welfare trade-off ratio then you are more willing to give up your benefits to, um, you know, for the benefit of someone else. Mm. And so what you really want to find is a guy who has a high welfare trade-off ratio skewed in your favour. You know, this is the kind of guy who 
you know, if you're out in the cold and you were freezing, he would take the coat off his back to give to you to keep you warm, mm -hmm. you know. And a guy with that kind of attitude and personality is going to be great across the board. He'll be looking after your well-being. And if you can reciprocate that, then you're going to have a fantastic relationship. You know, that's that's where you need to look for. I love this scientific approach that really does seem to put women in a place where they really have strong boundaries for themselves that maybe they haven't had before. And I think that's so important. So I, I think this, yeah. this approach is really interesting to, it's almost like that's, if you do meet the right person, that's the cherry on the, on the cake and not the whole cake, which is, the, which is where lots of women have gone wrong in the past where they've thought they've had to find somebody at all costs. Whereas this is kind of saying, you've got to have those boundaries in place for yourself and know what you want to expect, which is great. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's being it's being confident about what you're you're looking for, and mm. you know, having the tools to identify who are the right kind of guys. Um, and you know, that's basically what what I teach people is, is how to identify the right kinds, and then not not compromising on the things that matter. I mean, you can compromise, as I said, on on things that maybe don't matter in the long term for a good relationship, but don't compromise on you know how considerate this person is if they're willing yeah. to take your needs into account and you know don't be kind of you know don't let yourself be messed around and and um you know just don't go there yeah and you know a, a good thing to do i think when you get into the beginnings of a relationship is be very clear about what your boundaries are and what you're expecting from a relationship not necessarily this relationship but relationships in general yeah and if you find that you know the guy kind of obfuscates you know if, if he's like oh you're too needy you're too kind of demanding why do you want to talk about this stuff and um then that's a good indication that this guy is probably emotionally unavailable avoidantly attached perhaps mm -hmm. and you're not going to be able to have a good relationship with this person but if they come back and you know talk to you about what your needs are and and seem willing to, to listen and to sort of try and do their best to to meet your needs then, then you know that you've got a good person to be um, getting together with it's kind of about not um kind of thinking about how can i be attractive to this person how can i make them like me it's about asking yourself does this person have what it takes yes. to have yeah. a good relationship with me um and that's a different way of looking at it, but it's a much healthier way to look yeah, at it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And if you could give give women just one piece of advice, what would it be? Well, I think I think that really, um, you know, make sure that you're 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 being the selector. You're looking mm. at it on your terms. Um, I would, you know, if you find a guy that you know you like, you know, you can start off a friend relationship first of all, see where it goes, and then let things build up and um you know the science shows that if if we like someone if we like their personality and you know their um sense of humor and so on we begin to you know desire them physically more and more and that's how things can build up it might not be um as exciting as the you know the fireworks guy that you know yeah. you fall madly in lust with right on on you know first meeting but you know you stand a much better chance in this case of having a good um, relationship that doesn't you know waste all your emotional energy and someone that you can actually have a, a happy time with yeah. thank you for sharing so much it just makes perfect sense when you say it like that and I know that loads of women will be listening to this and, and hopefully it'll really make them think about how they are approaching dating so thank you so much I really really enjoyed that conversation last four questions I ask all my guests so do you have you a book that's really had an impact on you that's kind of a favorite yeah um yes i think that book that has inspired me and this is something i read a very long time ago it was when i was um, a monkey keeper in cornwall <laughs> i mean how amazing was that been? <laughs> i was a monkey keeper in cornwall and i read this book called um in the shadow of man by jane goodall and jane goodall um a lot of people will be familiar with the name she's a chimpanzee researcher she, and, and way back in the 60s she was studying chimpanzees at a place called Gombe in Tanzania and I just found it incredibly inspirational you know she was talking about all the amazing behaviors and, and, I, and I just thought I want to go and study animals in, in, in wild places you know because I kind of felt that if I could do that and, and contribute to the understanding of, of you know, behavior and other animals and the natural world, then, you know, 
if I could contribute to that knowledge that could potentially help us, you know, look after our world a bit more. And that's, yeah. that's what I was into. So I found that incredibly inspirational. And that actually set me off on the path of going around the world, studying animals and, you know, and then everything that happened subsequently. So it was a really, really, really important book for me. Yeah, I love that. I love how books can be so impactful on people's lives. It just takes one book doesn't it to change yeah. the course of everything which she obviously did for you what about yeah. a piece of song that motivates you or music yeah I was um some I, I've been listening to quite a lot of classical music lately and um just last night one of the pieces I was listening to was um it was a piece by Tchaikovsky um uh what was it again it's um the Violin Concerto in D Major is a beautiful, beautiful piece of music. And if anyone's interested in finding it, there's um, a YouTube video um, where Julia Fisher is the, the main um, violinist. Um, but anyway, the reason it was, it just sort of felt so important is, I mean, there's so much crap happening yeah. right now in the world. Yeah. And it just made me sort of feel, you know, it, it sort of restores my faith in humanity a bit, you know, people are capable of incredibly beautiful mm. things and when you listen to a piece of music like that you know it's yeah. quite emotional and it it does restore sort of faith in, in people a bit yeah yeah <laughs> we're capable yeah. of some really horrible things but we're capable of some really fab things as well yeah so. and that's what we are seeing you're so right we are seeing all the horrible stuff but equally amongst that yeah. there's some amazing people doing amazing things out there which is really kind of heartwarming isn't it yeah yeah and uh, what about who inspires you um that would have to be my mum <laughs> oh lovely <laughs> yeah my mum she's always been really strong in you know the, the face of various adversities and I mean one of the things that I have to thank her for is is instilling a sense of confidence in, in me and my siblings she always made us feel that we could do anything we wanted mm. and that was that was really valuable I think um and and she and my dad uh way back before I was born even um they, they taught in what's now Zambia for a while. They, were, they lived in Africa and my brothers were born there. Um, and so I grew up with like, you know, our African artifacts in the house and a, a massive map of the world on the wall. And, and I think, you know, all, all the stories around it and everything that really inspired me to want to explore and, and do unconventional things. And I think that really sort of shaped a lot of what I'm doing now. Um, so she she kind of laid the groundwork for me basically yeah. yeah you've obviously inherited that sense of adventure yeah 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 and what about if you could pay yourself a compliment what would it be <laughs> that, you told me you were going to ask this yeah <laughs> <laughs> um I think the com my compliment would be to call myself stubborn and I know that I know that doesn't sound like a compliment and actually it's probably meant that I've been a real pain in the ass some of the time but <laughs> I've, I've at various stages in my life I've managed to use this sort of stubbornness to be determined to achieve things yeah. and you know when it came to studying animals around the world that definitely came into play I was determined I was going to do this and it meant you know when I went to Brazil for instance I had to like just spend a whole year working in London saving like crazy to, to sort of get myself out there and then I decided I wanted to study um cetaceans you know whales and dolphins mm. um and so i wrote to every single research this is back in the days of writing letters yeah <laughs> i wrote letters to every single researcher studying whales and dolphins in the world to ask them if i could come and help them and eventually i got this reply from um some people in australia who had a, a, a humpback whale project going on and um so i kind of dropped everything i had no money and i was only getting a volunteer job but i just kind of thought I'll just go for it and see what happens. <laughs> I eventually I got a job working on, you know, I had started as a volunteer and got a job working on the, the Huntback Wheel project, but it was it was amazing. It was absolutely amazing. Oh, but it was. But then now I've kind of used that stubbornness, I suppose, to, you know, with, with my my new business, um, helping women. It's not been easy as anyone that's running their own yeah. business will absolutely know, but I'm making great inroads now and I'm so happy I'm doing that because you know it's, it's great to be helping people so stubbornness <laughs> yeah I can relate to that you're not a Taurus by any chance are you sorry you're not a Taurus are you 
by any chance? No, no, no. Because yeah. <laughs> I am, and I would say stubborn's one of my main traits as well, but I'm quite happy about it, just like you. Okay. <laughs> um, so how can people find out how they can work with you and how they can learn more about you? Uh, the best way is just to visit my website, which is datingevolved.com. Um, and you'll find all sorts of things there. You'll find all about my programs and stuff. Um, I've got a, um, a blog with lots of advice and, and things in there. Um, and there's a few free resources that you can sign up for. I've also got a masterclass coming up soon on the 4th of April. Um, depending on when you're listening to this um, podcast, I will be having um, other ones at other times yeah, as well. Yeah, we'll be coming out before then. So that's great timing. Excellent. <laughs> um, so you can find out that and sign, sign up for that on the, the website datingevolve.com. Brilliant. Well, send me the link as well and I'll add it to the show notes. I will do that. <laughs> Lovely. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you for sharing your knowledge with everybody. And I hope that's really helped set some absolute... people on the, uh, on the right track to finding, finding new love. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks, Rachel. Thank you. Take care. Cheers. Bye. I really enjoyed talking to Dr. Murray about that subject. It's a really interesting and completely makes sense when, when you hear her talk about the things that you should be doing to try and approach dating in a more scientific um, thought process because you know perhaps when you look back at your old dating record it's not served you best and you know it's not that you're doing anything wrong it's just you need to reframe things and really put yourself at the top of that pile that's what I really got from the conversation the most is to make sure that you are in a place of self-confidence self-belief and that anything else in life is just a cherry on the cake and you can make sure that you it fits your criteria rather than you having to change and fit in. And obviously, there's nothing wrong with being single. If you want to be single for the rest of your life, then absolutely, you do not have to have that pressure, do you? But for those that are looking for a partner and are wanting to know where to start later in life, this is a really helpful, interesting conversation. I'll be back next week with more inspiration. But in the meantime, look after yourselves and keep being fabulous.